Colorado's chief election denier under arrest, facing multiple felonies for tampering with voting systems. A court rules Doug Coe's school board can't keep making decisions in secret. It's against the law. Parents so desperate to get their kids' mental health help, they're sending them out of state. When you're splitting uh, kids away from their families or their support communities, we're creating new levels of trauma. It's snowing in our snowiest month. Is that news? I don't know. We're also going to send hundreds of young survivors of the Marshall Fire to summer camp. Is that news? I'm not sure either. But I know that this is next. So it's snowing today. Two to five inches expected on a day in Denver's snowiest month. So hope you're not surprised and hope you're warm and cozy. So let's talk about other news. It's being described as one of America's first insider threats on elections. An elections clerk in Colorado just turned herself in to face felony charges for tampering with voting systems. Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters also happens to be a Republican candidate for Secretary of State, the job overseeing elections. Steve Sager starts us off with what we learned from today's indictment. Republican Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters was booked Wednesday afternoon after turning herself in to face a grand jury indictment, seven felonies and three misdemeanors. Her deputy clerk, Belinda Nicely, there too, booked on six charges in that same indictment. Mesa County Republican DA Dan Rubenstein says these are likely the only charges they'll face, but... We do still have a parallel investigation going with the uh, FBI uh, into some devices, and that might uh, change, uh, you know, add some additional people. Peters and Nicely's conduct is linked to the spring of 2021 in the lead-up to an election security software upgrade required by the Secretary of State. They're accused of concocting a plot to copy the hard drives of the county's election machines before that upgrade, a copy of which ended up online along with passwords months later. Nicely is accused of getting all the surveillance cameras in the elections office shut off days before the upgrade, she says at the order of Peters. The indictment says the pair recruited a man named Gerald Wood to come on as a temporary employee. Wood's involvement is important in this because his badge was used to access the computers, and Peters introduced a man that she was with as Gerald Wood the day the state came in to do the upgrade. But Wood told the grand jury he was only in the office for a day, turned in his badge at the end of the day, and wasn't there when his badge was used in the alleged conduct. It seems he was set up uh, as a stooge here so that she could sneak somebody else uh, into the facility to be able to uh, obtain the image. Matt Crane is the executive director of the County Clerks Association and the former Republican clerk from Arapahoe County. He agrees with the charges, stopping short of calling for Peter's resignation, which he says is up to her community. For, you know, the other clerks in the state who did the right thing, um, you know, there's a, there's a sense of uh, relief. There is a sense of, um, in some ways, vindication. A couple of moments before we got word that Peters had turned herself in, her campaign for Secretary of State released a lengthy statement calling the charges politically motivated and an attempt to remove a strong challenger from the race against Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Griswold herself described Peters' actions as an insider attack against election security. Kyle. Steve, I... I am by no means an expert on doing crimes, but I've always thought if I was if I was going to do crimes, I would be careful not to talk about them in public. And one thing that you see is some of the stuff that she's accused of doing that they say are crimes is stuff that Clerk Peters has just openly talked about, like on podcasts, on TV and all over the place. Think about the day that we learned about all of this that evening. Tina Peters appeared on at Mike Lindell's security summit. We knew so much about this indictment already. Really, the only new piece of news we, we found out there was that this may not have been Gerald Wood, as we long thought it was. It may be someone else. Now the question is, who was that person who was with Tina Peters the day of the trusted bill that she identified to others as Gerald Wood when he says he wasn't there? Mike Lindell, the pillow guy. Chances yeah. are he would have been, people might have known who he was, yeah, but who knows? The pillow guy. Yeah. What, a, what a time to be alive. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve. A judge is ordering Douglas County School Board to do its business in public, as the law requires. The judge issued a preliminary injunction against the conservative majority on the school board today, saying that evidence suggests that they decided privately amongst themselves to fire the superintendent before they went and did it at a meeting where public comment was prohibited. 
A citizen sued the four conservative members of the school board, accusing them of violating the state's open meeting laws through what's called a, a walking quorum. Basically, it's when a, a public officials have a series of like small meetings that are designed to skirt the law that requires them to make their decisions in public together. Colorado courts have not ruled on whether a walking quorum, those small meetings, simply violates the spirit of the law or is straight up illegal in our state. The judge's injunction today orders the Dugco School Board to stop it while the lawsuit proceeds. Dugco Schools declined to say anything about the injunction. When a child is in a mental health crisis, parents who just want to wrap that kid in comfort are sometimes forced to send their child out of state because the help they need can't be found in Colorado. Anusha Roy has that story. Kids in crisis are not getting the help they need in Colorado so often. You know, one in four kids sitting in the inpatient unit at Children's uh, is up against an out-of-state placement. That health care providers are feeling defeated. It makes you feel like you're not good at your job because you can't give these parents and their children what they absolutely deserve. Heidi Baskfield with Children's Hospital Colorado said over the last decade, Colorado lost a thousand beds for youth mental health care. This is happening as more kids are coming in sicker. So these children are being sent out of state for care, often by themselves. When you have other siblings at home, when you have to keep your job to be able to pay for the services that your child needs, and you're gonna have to be separated from them potentially across the other side of the country, these conversations are horrible. They're horrible. Our, our, our son struggled with um, serious depression and suicidality. Democratic Representative Daphna Michelson Janae knows what it's like to fall through this crack. There still wasn't anything in state where we felt he could both be safe and educated. She's sponsoring a bill aiming to close the gap in care that also highlights the pitfalls of our mental health care system, like the lack of care across the board, which is why, if approved, the bill would fund a new neuropsych facility with 16 beds. 16 beds? We can't do this because let me tell you, we are sending away 60 to 70 kids a year. They explained those 60 to 70 kids aren't going at the same time. There's um, ebb and flow. It would also fund an additional 30 beds around the state for continued care. But staffing that is a massive challenge. It's not for a lack of trying or even a, uh, investment because new dollars are flowing in and are paying providers differently in this space. But it's late in the game. So Bassfield, who you just heard from, said that this issue is just going to go on for a while, that it's also causing trauma for these kids. And part of the reason she said that the state lost a thousand beds over the last 10 years is because of the funding model here. And it's all related to issues with financial incentives, issues with insurance, as well as funneling tax dollars towards this problem, Kyle. You know, Anusha, I feel like you taught us during the pandemic that a bed without trained staff to care for the people in it is just furniture. It's not really helpful. Yeah, and everyone we talked to today said that is going to be the biggest challenge. Even if this bill gets passed, if you don't have the people to take care of these kids, what is the point of all of it? So it's actually a part of a group of bills that would, if it's approved, use some federal dollars to fund. And the idea is to then train and educate people within the communities that are getting these additional beds and start building a pipeline of more staff so that there is someone to take care of these children. All right, Anusha, thank you. Look twice when we heard this today. The state of Colorado is rounding up law enforcement body armor and ballistic helmets and is going to try to send them to Ukraine. The state's collecting the equipment from police departments and sheriff's offices, not the general public. Colorado's Department of Public Safety, the state agency, says it alone will donate 750 helmets and 80 sets of body armor. They say it's all been used, but is still usable. So strange to think about on a day when, when snow's falling, but parents across Colorado are making summer camp plans for kids. It's one more thing to sort out and one more potential expense for the 1,000 families who lost their homes in the Marshall Fire. That's why your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week supports the YMCA of Northern Colorado. Each year, they offer financial assistance to 500 kids so that they can have a wonderful summer camp experience without their family stressing about money. This year, that nonprofit's expanding to offer a chance for another 250 young Coloradans whose families lost their homes in the Marshall Fire to go to camp. So 750 kids are going to have a summer camp experience that their families might not have thought was going to be possible. 
I really like how YMCA of Northern Colorado is going about this. They're going to launch this campaign, you may hear about it in the coming weeks, to get 250 fire survivors to camp this year. They know that some of the affected families are not going to need financial assistance. Those kids are just welcome to come, but other families will need some help. So they're going to work one-on-one -on -one with each interested family to see what it'll take to get their children to camp this summer. And none of those camp slots are going to come at the expense of the 500 other young Coloradans who are getting financial assistance to go to camp. So let's do this. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you the link to donate. As always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. Some of the families who lost houses in the Marshall Fire are financially set. Some of them are not. So for those families, let's see if we can lift one financial burden and send their kids to camp. It's cold. Gas is expensive. Not that gas. The gas we use to heat our homes. Let's look at what energy companies are doing to avoid a repeat of a winter bill spike. Coloradans are always being told to drive less and bike more. So it's not super that bike lanes are still toboggan runs a week after it snowed. Mobility slip sliding away. Next. Denver's drivers are warned about the day after a snowstorm. Warning for people who bike might as well last a week or more because they're still dealing with the ice. Lucas sent us a photo yesterday of the bikeway on 35th between Julian and Irving Street and the bike lanes covered in a sheet of ice. It's one of those bikeways that's designed to give priority to people who are walking or biking. City took a look and said, you know what, that's not a plow issue because, you know, shady spots are going to stay icy. The city did say that people can always report trouble spots to 311 and request that they remove the ice or come in to throw some de-icer. Winter weather advisory for Denver as moderate snow continues to fall. Roads are icy and snowpack. Temperatures in the single digits, but wind chill values to minus eight in downtown Denver. Heaviest snow bands will move through between now and midnight. Winter weather and travel advisories cover much of Colorado. Advisories for heavy snow in the northern mountains and a difficult drive on I-25 tonight as those snow bands sink south and east. We'll see some improvement after midnight. Tomorrow will be bitter cold, mostly cloudy, with a few leftover snow showers and additional light snow in the southern mountains as the second upper air disturbance moves in. Denver is in that two to four inch range tonight. The foothill areas three to six inches by tomorrow morning. We have a bitter cold high tomorrow of 20 with clearing late and a low of three. 30s Friday, 50s and 60s for the weekend. Don't forget daylight saving time. Spring ahead. Set those clocks ahead one hour on Sunday morning. You know, there are those memes that joke about Colorado having like 12 seasons, how we have winter and you get full spring, you get second winter and then spring of deception. And then the third winter comes down like a ton of bricks, We're kind of in the tricky part. Now, March is typically our snowiest month on average in Colorado. Our resident meteorologist poet Corey Reppenhagen was inspired by this evening's snow. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. March reputation. We tremble at its mention. An appetizer? That was Corey Reppenhagen on the Weather Beat. Temps are below freezing today. Soon our energy companies will have to do a lot more to prevent us from getting gouged when our bill arrives. Some of them have already started that work. And it's a sign of wishful thinking on a below freezing day. Next. Last winter, we learned how expensive this kind of cold can be, especially when something happens to strain the energy supply. Energy companies ended up paying ridiculous amounts for natural gas in February of 2021. And we should find out later this month if Xcel is going to be able to pass along all those costs to customers. Other energy companies like Atmos and Black Hills Energy have already completed their hearing with the state's utility regulators. They can recoup their costs, but they're now required to notify customers on ways to confer, conserve 
when the energy demand is expected to be high. They might have to send out direct emails or social media posts or even news releases that we can then pass along to you. Excel's not yet required to do that. They did send a release. Excel wants customers to pay for more than $500 million in electric and gas costs from that one week cold snap last year. Excel's asked state regulators to approve that that would then have the company spreading out those costs over two to five years. Depending on what state regulators decide, your Excel bill could go up a few bucks a month because that one week. It's a sign that's trying to manifest warmer weather for all of us. Sarah was up in Fort Collins Sunday and saw this outside a business complex at Harmony and LeMay. 74 balmy degrees and bunch of snow on the ground. Sarah says it's the coldest 74 she'd ever felt. Uh, we have some sources in the weather department that says that the high in Fort Collins Sunday was actually more like 24 degrees. There's a story behind this. Uh, owner of the building says they've been stuck on 74 for a couple of months. They noticed it was broken in December when it got cold, but the temperature stayed the same. This has kind of been a running joke in town ever since as people send them photos of 74 degrees and all kinds of weather. Uh, it alternates with the time like those clocks do and uh, the time's always been accurate. They've had somebody out several times to fix it. So far, it's stuck. So 74 degrees it is. Kids whose families lost their homes in the Marshall Fire have not had a whole lot to look forward to lately. We're going to try to give them an awesome summer camp experience. That and your feedback next. Each summer, 500 young Coloradans get a chance to go to the YMCA of Northern Colorado summer camps, thanks in part to financial support from generous people in our community. This year, that nonprofit is trying to bring another 250 kids to camp out of the 1,000 families who lost homes in the Marshall Fire. They're going to work with each family that's interested to determine if they need financial assistance to make that happen. And if they do, well, that's where we come in. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. You can join me in donating. A reminder, these camp slots for kids from families who lost homes, they're in addition to the financial assistance that's also open to the entire community in Boulder and Weld and Larimer County. So nobody's missing out on camp. This is about expanding the experience to make sure that some of the kids who have had a really difficult year have something that they can put on the calendar and look forward to this summer. Uh, Jim in Fort Collins asked a really good question. How much does it cost the YMCA to send a kid to camp? I asked the exact same thing. It varies quite a bit depending on which camp the kid is going to, whether they're just going for a couple of days, whether they're going for more of like a full summer camp type experience, depending on what their parents' work schedules are. So it varies quite a bit in terms of uh, the camp experience, also varies in terms of family's need. That's why they're going to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of feedback about uh, Mesa County's Republican elections clerk, Tina Peters, getting arrested for tampering with voting equipment today. Beth says, now go after the Democrats who violated the election laws. If you know of any in Colorado, you email me next at 9news.com. I'll look for your email, Beth. We'll see you all next time.